Mike, thank you very much indeed. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to the Deputy Premier, to all of the uh, officers of the Property Council of Australia. Thank you to uh, all of the sponsors who've made this event possible. Thank you also to my colleagues at JLL in Australia who've given me a lot of help in preparing to be here. Now, I was going to say how lucky you are that I brought this marvellous weather with me from London, and I'm sure that you're all enjoying the sunshine, but I, I imagine that thinking about cities as we sit here in this tropical paradise is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but I'm going to try to talk about this phenomena, this idea of new world cities, and it's going to be a presentation really in four parts. I'll talk about the background to what a new world city is. We'll go on to talking about the disruption effects, not just of technologies, but of demographics and geopolitics. We'll then talk for a little bit about Australian cities and how they fit this model and what's happening in Australian cities from a kind of outside-in perspective. And then I'll end up talking about property, planning, real estate, and uh, some of the leadership issues that go with that. Now, I'm extremely lucky that nearly all the work I do is done through partnerships. So uh, in the last year, I've been working with colleagues at JLL on this New World Cities concept. I've been working with uh, the Brookings Institution and the OECD on the idea of uh, new deals for cities, city deals, if you like. And I've been working with the Urban Land Institute on technology, property and urban development, densification, drivers of change in the built environment. And all of that I'll try to bring to bear uh, on this. Um, next week, the Brookings Institution is going to publish my new book. This is The Plug. It's called Global Cities, A Short History. And what we try to do in this book is talk about the connections between technology and business cycles, um, waves of cities that globalize, and then the paths that they take into globalization. I'll return to this slide in a few minutes because I want to talk particularly about Australian cities and the current cycle. But my basic approach to all of this is to say that technology, geopolitics and economic change, particularly trade, come together to create these big cycles. Then large numbers of cities decide to participate in the new cycle of globalization and they do so in ways that are individually decided but they end up learning and collaborating with each other and in particular for Australian cities I'm going to argue there's a ready-made peer group of other new world cities that they can work with learn from be inspired by but also teach a few things and then there are different specific paths that cities take depending upon their economic and demographic profile, their built environment, their infrastructure and everything else. And we'll try to go through all of that. Now, the current cycle that we're in seems to me to be a very important cycle. It's not just that we're about one third of the way through a hundred year cycle in which the world's population is moving from being predominantly non-urban to being massively urban, from 25% non-urban to 75% urban. That's very important because it means that cities are at the heart of our societies, our economies, they're at the heart of our public policy dilemmas and all of our challenges. But also over this 100 years, the world's population is going to stabilize. So instead of this phenomenal population growth that we've all got used to, that's factored into all of our calculations about climate change and sustainability and everything else, the world's population stabilizes through this and the next cycle. Now, to my mind, what that means is that what happens in the next 30 years in terms of cities and their positioning, their connectivity, their infrastructure, their uh, built environment, their urban form, is going to, as it were, synchronize with a much longer term pattern which should be relatively stable. So it means for the next cycle or two, the competition between cities, the jostling for position, the investment in competitive infrastructure, improvements in connectivity and relationships between cities will be key for the long term. We're setting in train patterns that might last for 100 or 200 years. So it's not just urbanization, it's also population stabilization that seems to me to be very important. And when we come later to talk about city systems, we'll review this. Also a feature of the current cycle is this explosion in technological connectivity and mobility. So connectivity and mobility work together to increase competition, but also to create the space for complementarity between places. 
And so much more of the content of a city's economy is today contested through competitive processes. And that means for all cities and city regions, metropolitan areas, also for state governments, thinking about what we want to hold on to and what we want to grow is just as important as what we want to attract because everything we already have is subject to competitive contexts. That means, as uh, everybody knows, that the, uh, the sources of growth, the patterns of trade, the patterns of cross-border investment are hugely evolving at the moment. And despite the fact that you read in the newspapers and see on the TV that there's, of course, a reaction to this cycle of globalization, the fundamental increase in cross-border flows of talent, of firms, of capital and ideas is there for everyone to see and it's fueled, of course, by the growth of these new economies as the economy moves both south and east. And you can see very clearly in this diagram of the center of gravity of the global economy that uh, the economy is moving back towards the south and towards the east in a very rapid way. That is, of course, underpinned in the current cycle by very large-scale investment in infrastructure. Just take what the Chinese government is doing and what the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is up to with the, the new Silk Roads proposition. Very large-scale infrastructure designed not just to move people from A to B, but to create a new kind of spatial economy, a new kind of economic geography, prioritizing certain places over others, creating a new balance as Western China emerges, giving a new role to the stands, creating particular points of connection in ASEAN and in East Africa, literally using infrastructure investment to really shape global economic geography. And that means perhaps that for the first time, looking at these infrastructures, looking at these ideas about different kinds of cities, we can start to estimate what might be what we would call the system of cities, let's say in Asia, as this diagram tries to show you. In 2050, in two cycles time, how many big cities doing what sorts of things will exist, what sort of connectivity will be between them. This is that process of imagining how our century is going to play out and how this will set in train through the next 30 years, these relationships then, that, that will then be stable for some period to come. Now, underpinning all of this, of course, are some fundamental choices about how cities grow. And I, I'm very aware of the work that the Property Council has done around densification. Uh, this diagram simply reminds us all that there's basically three ways of accommodating urban growth. On the one hand, we can allow cities to sprawl, which is what we've more or less done for the last hundred years. Uh, on the other hand, we can build new cities, as they do in the Middle East and China and various parts of Latin America. Or thirdly, we can focus on densification and indeed metropolitanization of our existing cities. And of course, if you do any analytical work on the advantages and disadvantages of these models, you'll find that all of the advantages in terms of adopting new technologies, all of the advantages in terms of productivity and enterprise and job creation, or the advantages in terms of social integration and tackling poverty, or the advantages in terms of energy systems and carbon, there are huge advantages to the densification of the existing cities. And of course, the political challenge of how we make what's clearly, in a sense, uh, from the evidence base, the right answer to this question, but how we make that politically popular and acceptable is the great challenge of this cycle, and not one, of course, that's easy to, to deal with. Now, it's also fair to say that if we're picking up this conversation about our current cycle, we can see this as really beginning, this fourth wave of the globalization process is really beginning in 2008 uh, with this global financial crisis that we're all aware of. And I think what's interesting, if you're from Australia, is to notice that it's really been these last two waves, the wave that began you know, in the late 90s, uh, or the, the early 90s and the late 80s, and then this new wave beginning in 2008, where Australian cities have really started to participate in the wave of cities that are globalizing. Um, Sydney and Melbourne, obviously, through the process of globalization of financial services, professional services, elite higher education, 
uh, Brisbane and Perth participating in this current cycle, very much fueled by new technology use both in the commodity sector, but new technologies in terms of digital life sciences and other kinds of uh, developments. And Canberra and Adelaide, of course, figuring out how they can participate in this process of globalization. So Australian cities are, in a sense, leading cities in this new wave that is synchronized with this new cycle of globalization and very important to observe therefore that there are other partners for them to work with. Now in the report that I've already referred to, the, the New World of Cities, which was then complemented by the second report on benchmarking the future of world cities that the JLL Cities Research Center worked together with us on and, and published, we tried to identify what's the future of the world cities, what are the different models through which cities can globalize. And uh, you know already that the observation here, well, there are broadly three kinds of cities. The established world cities, the Londons, the Hong Kongs, and the New Yorks, and we'll come back to them. The emerging world cities, the Shanghais, Beijing, Dubai, Sao Paulo. And then this third group of new world cities, who are the group that are the most fast growing, and are the group through which many more cities are participating in this global economy. The fundamental observation underpinning all of this is that there are many more cities becoming world cities or global cities today. They're doing it in different ways and it's driven by this new generation of technologies that we'll talk about.